Okay, hi again, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming and participating in our webinar. We're glad to see so many of you in the chat box. Um, so just a reminder before we get started, if everyone can mute themselves and keep their video feeds off, that would really help with our um, audio quality here so that everybody can hear. Um, so we'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to the webinar. Uh, it's called Integrating Family Planning with Primary Healthcare Approaches and Lessons. And again, my name is Rebecca Husband. I'm a Family Planning Technical Advisor with Population Services International, or PSI. Um, PSI is really proud to co-host this webinar with Results for Development, and it's my pleasure to moderate this discussion with our four distinguished speakers. And they are Michael Chaikin from Results for Development, Jane Rowan from Marie Stopes International, Dr. Pura Angela Wiko from Thinkwell, and Sylvia Wamuhu from Population Services Kenya. So this discussion about integrating family planning and other vertical programs comes amidst, uh, amid, amidst growing global movements for universal health coverage and primary health care. In that context, R4D and PSI have sought to better understand what integration means in practice, under what conditions it leads to better health outcomes, and how countries might approach integration-related decision-making. In a moment, Michael's going to start us off with a taste of what we found, after which the other speakers will share insights from their three countries' ongoing efforts to more fully integrate family planning into primary health care. So just a few housekeeping things first. Um, throughout the discussion, we invite you to share your questions and comments via the chat function in WebEx, shown on the slide here. And you can also use chat to share with us any technology issues you may be having. Um, so we'll get back to you on that. We ask all audience members to mute your microphones and keep your video feeds off again, just so that we can make sure the audio quality is pretty good um, for everyone involved. Um, also to the presenters, we have a lot of great information, as you know, to get through in the hour. So just a little bit of advance warning, I'll be pretty strict with our timekeeping, um, and I'll try to be as friendly as possible. So with these housekeeping items dressed, I'll now turn it over to Michael Chaikin to frame today's discussion based on our recently completed work. Michael is a senior program officer at R4D, where he focuses on health system strengthening, financing, and the sustainability, integration, and transition of donor-dependent health programs. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much, Rebecca. R4D has had the pleasure of partnering with PSI on this work for the last 18 months, and I'm excited to share some of the highlights today. Before diving in, I should note that our work and today's webinar were both made possible by the collaborative efforts of 10 authors whose names appear on this slide and by generous support from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We undertook this work in hopes of contributing clarity and nuance to policy debates about integration of vertical programs. Last year marked the 40th anniversary of Alma-Ada, and we are no longer in a world in which debating holistic versus selective primary health care makes sense. Instead, most low- and middle-income countries have a mix of health programs, some fully embedded in the mainstream health system, others highly vertical, and many somewhere in between. In this context, governments and donors increasingly wonder whether they are reaching the limits of what they can achieve with vertical programs without leveraging the broader health system. Additionally, with the universal health coverage movement gaining momentum and the future of donor funding uncertain, each vertical community is grappling with how to approach the UHC discourse. So the question isn't whether family planning in principle belongs in primary health care, but rather what should countries do with existing vertical programs for family planning and other health needs as they seek to strengthen primary health care? This work can often feel conceptual, but it is fundamentally about people. We can imagine a young woman with a range of health needs who ideally would have access to a system that delivered quality primary health care. Whether she gets those services depends on her in part and also on a lot of other actors. We might also think about the people charged with stewarding the health system. On the right, you can see arguably the three most important health officials in Ghana. Clockwise from the top, they are the Minister of Health, the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, and the Acting CEO of the National Health Insurance Authority. 
Just as the woman will make choices about when and where to seek health services for herself and her family, officials like these will need to make a range of choices that affect the availability, quality, and cost of the services she needs. From their perspective, integration might seem like a great idea. Many claim that integration can bolster access to services and improve their quality and efficiency. In theory, these effects should produce better health outcomes. But there may be good reasons for caution. After all, it's not as if vertical programs exist for no reason, and those who care deeply about family planning or other health needs may worry that integration will dilute attention to their priorities, inhibit scale-up, force reliance on weak health systems, divert resources from certain providers or populations, or reduce accountability. These concerns are especially acute in the context of donor transition. To make sense of these competing claims, we reviewed about 100 integration studies plus systematic reviews covering more than 200 additional sources dating back to the 1970s. We also interviewed health and family planning stakeholders in Ghana and Malawi. We learned quite a lot. For instance, when stakeholders talk about integration, most focus on either how a patient accesses services or how providers organize themselves to deliver services, or both. The quote you see from a Malawian interviewee is one example. This orientation is also reflected in the literature, with most evaluations of integration focused on the service delivery environment. This is unfortunate given that strengths and weaknesses in other health system functions tend to determine whether integration yields better outcomes or boosts efficiency. Failed integration efforts often neglected critical links between service delivery and other health system functions, like governance and financing. The evidence also shows that benefits more readily accrue from the integration of natural service combinations, like those for people experiencing both HIV and TB. Integrating time-intensive services like counseling women about a range of family planning methods is harder without appropriate attention to workloads, incentives, and support systems. Finally, there are some examples of integration leading to worse outcomes. For example, in the early 2000s, Cambodia experienced a decline in coverage when it shifted vitamin A supplementation from a more vertical immunization days to more integrated facility-based delivery. In summary, there is a lot of promising evidence, but it's not enough to recommend wholesale integration of any vertical program in any context. Nonetheless, integration decisions are happening, so we wanted to offer some ideas for how to think about whether, when, and how to integrate vertical programs. To start, we needed a way to think holistically about integration as a process of changing the relationship between a vertical program and the rest of the health system. To characterize that relationship in detail, we used a framework developed by the Primary Healthcare Performance Initiative and shown here in simplified form. The framework acts as a logic model for PHC outputs and outcomes derived from a range of upstream determinants, the system and input sections, in combination with service delivery. In case studies on Ghana and Malawi, we show how this framework can be used for detailed descriptive analysis of a family planning program and the broader health system. It also provides a useful way to catalog the interrelated elements of integration efforts and map the enablers of and obstacles to further integration. Unpacking a vertical program in relation to the broader system reveals that integration doesn't need to be an all or nothing or all at once proposition. At any point in time, different components of a program may be more or less integrated than others, and countries can decide which components to integrate next versus those where immediate changes could be too risky. We didn't stop there, though, because decision-making requires more than analysis. We attempted to describe, in a stylized fashion, a decision-making process into which analysis can feed, one that blends consultative and analytic steps and is embedded in a country's routine health planning process. First, proponents should clarify the objectives of integration, which might include increased access, efficiency, quality, or equity. Second, decision makers should unpack the status quo 
to understand the current relationship between a vertical program and the broader system, and to identify areas of opportunity and risk. Third is defining integration options, many of which will entail partial integration while retaining some components dedicated to the vertical program area. Fourth, stakeholders should assess integration options for potential costs, benefits, and feasibility, though at times these may be difficult to estimate given the complexity of health system reforms. It may be useful or necessary to look beyond cost-benefit ratios for options that secure political support and avoid risking major disruptions to essential services. Finally, once one or more options are selected, it will be essential to monitor each stage of implementation to determine its effects, to provide warning if adverse consequences begin to emerge, and to feed lessons into the next planning cycle. Unfortunately, we don't have time today to go into more detail, so I'd like to point you to a handful of products published yesterday. First is a blog summarizing our findings, and second, for those interested in even more detail, I encourage you to check out our full technical paper and Ghana and Malawi case studies, all now available on the R4D website. In a moment, we will add links to these new resources in the chat box, and we will circulate them after the event. In the meantime, I'll close with three things to remember. First, successful integration is about more than service delivery. It requires attention across all vertical program components and health system functions. Second, integration is neither all or nothing nor all at once. It is essential to unpack a vertical program in relation to the broader health system some program components may be amenable to integration sooner or faster than others. And finally, better integration analysis should feed into a country-driven decision-making process about whether, when, and how to integrate. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to learning with you from the other speakers and to taking your questions later in the session. Great. Thank you, Michael. Thanks very much for that initial framing. And again, we're going to look forward to hearing more from you during the Q&A session later on. Um, so from PSI's perspective, just to say that we were also very glad to be part of this work and working with R4D and others. Um, it's very timely to the new strategic direction that we're going and looking at how uh, we can deliver the services that beneficiaries need, where, when, and how they want them. So I very much hope that the participants will check out those um, reports in the blog, and the links, again, have been added to the chat box, so you should be able to access them. Um, a friendly reminder to please use that chat box for any comments and questions as we continue. So next, um, I'd like to bring our other panelists into this discussion, and I'll introduce each of them before they make their first contribution. So first, um, we'll talk with Jane Rowan of MSI. Jane Rowan is Deputy Director of Health Markets at Marie Stopes International, or MSI, where she provides direction on linking service delivery with insurance and contracting. For five years, she has supported the African Health Markets for Equity Program, or AME. Jane previously worked as technical advisor at PSI in both Myanmar and Lao PDR, and she has 20 years of experience managing private provider networks in low- and middle-income countries. Jane, so AME is supporting Ghana's National Health Insurance Authority to implement, at, at long last, coverage for family planning. So a couple of questions. Um, why has it taken so long to implement this policy, and what provides the impetus now to overcome those obstacles? And as implementation began, to what extent was family planning already integrated into PHC, and which components of family planning stood partially or fully apart? Over to you. Great. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Lovely. Thank you. So, as you will see in this timeline, the National Health Insurance Scheme was established in 2003. Um, at that time, um, family planning was excluded, and one of the main reasons was that when it was established, it was a civil service package, and it was mainly for inpatient care. Um, as you will go to see, Free maternity services was added for all pregnant women in 2008, but contraception was still excluded. Um, the Act was revised in 2012 and included a full coverage of family planning services. So to answer the first question first, um, to what extent was family planning already integrated with PHC? From a service integration perspective, it is mainly the same providers 
who offer primary health care and family planning, although in the larger facilities, the FP is provided in the old Skyney units. But from a payment perspective, the commodities were free, but clients had to pay out of pocket for services in both the public and private sector. So the only exception was tubal ligations, which was covered under inpatient care, but only, of course, if you held the National Health Insurance card. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So the contraception or family planning was added in 2012, but implementation actually stalled. So I think we have to give acknowledgement of what happened to the advocates and the researchers who demonstrated that by adding family planning into the service package, you could not only save money, but save lives. But as we know, these decisions do not play out in vacuums. Um, so one of the main issues was that the NHIS was very cautious about adding it to the, to the benefits because of the financial implications. Um, so to answer the second question about why now and what provided the impetus, um, there was a new government that was elected in 2016 who had made um, various declarations, um, one about getting uh, family planning included through the Sustainable Development Goals and Ghana Beyond Aid, um, and it just seemed a good time, so Maristopes uh, decided that uh, to move the theory to effective implementation and was luckily to secure donor funding for this. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, Jane. Um, that's really helpful context from Ghana. Uh, next, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Pura Angela Ko, a health policy and systems expert working with ThinkWell in the Philippines to support implementation of the newly approved UHC law. She has also served in numerous roles in the Philippine health system, including in government and various development agencies, academic centers, and NGOs. Angela holds a medical degree and a Master of Science in Public Health, and she is finishing her Master of Arts in Health Policy. So Angela, turning to you, like in Ghana, the Philippines is exploring how best to cover family planning alongside other PHC services through its public insurer, PhilHealth. So again, a couple of questions. Compared to Ghana, how is the impetus similar or different for the Philippines to sort out integrating FP into PhilHealth coverage? And who is championing this agenda with government and beyond? Over to you. Hi, Angela, are you, are you having issues? Hi, Angela, we're not hearing you. Okay, Angela, we're gonna go ahead and skip ahead um, while you're able to work on the audio. So just let us know when you think you've solved that. Um, so we'll move on to Sylvia Wamuhu, who's the Director of Franchise and Partnership at Population Services Kenya. Sylvia has over 18 years experience working with the private sector, and her current role includes spearheading implementation of impactful programs and the evolution of franchises and the franchise model into a sustainable business model. She holds an MBA from the University of Nairobi. So Sylvia, um, we're turning to you now while we wait for Angela's audio to be fixed. So in Kenya, AME is also supporting PS Kenya to develop a network organization model, or NMO, called Tunza Platinum to contribute to Kenya's UHC goals. So a couple of questions for you. Um, why did PS Kenya choose a social enterprise model as a response to the, to the government's call for UHC? And can you tell us a little bit about how the NMO works and, and how it brings together the socially franchised providers to deliver PHC services in a more integrated way? Thanks, and over to you. Okay, thank you, Rebecca. I hope you can hear me. Yep, loud and clear. Okay, I start by, by highlighting the UHC vision in Kenya. And it is by 2021, all Kenyans will have access to essential services without the risk of financial hardship. If the government of Kenya has achieved a very high target, then it must integrate the private sector in the delivery of primary health care. And why do I say this? This is because in Kenya we have about 9,500 health facilities, and about over 50% of this 
are owned by private the, the private providers. They could be full commercial, others are supported by NGOs, and others are FPOs. In addition, the private sector provides outpatient and inpatient services to 42% and 44% of the total population, respectively. And yet, it is highly fragmented and unregulated, and you can see how it's important it is in the achievement of universal health coverage. And as a result of this fragmentation, the provision of health services is of low quality and unstandardized, and then it also prevents limited access to health services because of the varied scope of services, valid pricing, and also the valid capacity of the private providers. And on the other hand, you see that the small private providers are not attractive to investors, such as national health insurance, and even other private investors that could be interested in investing, you know, driving their business to the small private providers. And of course, they have low bargaining power. In 2008, the TUNSA PS Kenya established the TUNSA network with funding from USAID and DFID, with the main objective being to support the small and middle level private providers to offer affordable and affordable and quality FP services. With time, we have integrated the services to include another eight health areas. But now under the larger umbrella of PSI, the TUNSA franchise is evolving into a social enterprise model, which is aimed at a addressing the gap being experienced in the private sector in a sustainable model. The next slide shows how the model works. And in Kenya, the social enterprise has taken the format of a network management organization, dubbed the Tunza Platinum. And we started rolling out this model in, 2000, in 2017 with funding from the AMI, I mean from AMI. And this is mainly funded by Bill and Melida Gates and DFID. So the model works in a way, in a way, how the model works is about bringing the small and alone health facilities together and presenting them into and presenting them to the <clears throat> insurance companies as one aggregated and legal entity so that they can provide services to insurance policyholders to the I mean on behalf of the insurance companies. So at the end of the day, it tends to have been a win-win business case where they have access as a large network with controlled pricing and services. The healthcare providers get, I mean, attract new revenue streams, such as, I mean, from the insurance business, and of course, reduce out of pocket for the community members and access to standardized quality services. So we see that the community members, of course, benefit from access of primary health care. So when you go to the next slide, you'll see that the NMO, apart from presenting Apart from that one value proposition, which is the aggregation, the other value proposition such as improved business case, quality assurance, that is very key when it comes to the provision of primary health care, affordable quality products and equipment, and also increased demand. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. Um, we're still working on Angela's uh, audio, so if Angela's able to send us a chat just to say that things are working. Um, we'll get back to your set of questions, but Sylvia, if you don't mind, we'll stay with you. Um, thanks for that overview. So could we hear a little bit more about how the new operation model is working? So why did PS Kenya decide to integrate and consolidate functions like quality assurance? And how have changes to that model affected access to PHC and provider efficiency? Over to you. Okay. PS Kenya has integrated a number of services, especially quality, uh, quality assurance. And the reason why we integrated the services, of course, is because the consumer is becoming more sophisticated. So the that we have integrated, I mean, the other thing that has made us integrate is the limited resources. Of course, we have to be very innovative in the way we do business and very and at the same time we have to ensure that the same person that we are targeting is able to afford the services at the private health facilities. So some of the services that we have integrated at the facility level, the scope of services as I mentioned before, we started off with family planning, but now we have moved to eight health areas, including HIV, AMCI, TB, amongst others. In terms of the way we carry out our quality improvement in the at the facility level. We have the quality assurance officers handling all the components of quality. Previously, we used to have a standalone team handling the clinical aspect using HNTOS, that is Health Network 
quality improvement system tackling the structural problems using the CETIA internationally accredited tools. And another team was handling NHIF. Due to, you know, because of the limited resources, and of course, we also need to be very innovative in the way we do business, we have integrated these components, and one quality assurance officer is carrying out all these tasks. Again, we have also integrated the business component because these are private facilities and they need to be in business, and it is about just showing them and supporting them how they can grow their businesses. At the community level, we have integrated demand creation activities such as family planning, cervical cancer, and safe, safe, safe motherhood. Over time, we've realized that we need to integrate relevant health areas because one, I mean, one strategy does not fit all. So you'll see that in the next slide that we have to be very clever in the way we do the integration. What are some of the what are some of the effects of the integration and how does it affect provider efficiency? By doing that, we achieved one thing. It became the, the, the facilities that have integrated services became a one-stop shop for the consumers whereby they would access high-quality services because of the increased scope of services. One woman going for family planning could be having issues with, I mean, cervical cancer, so they would be screened for cervical cancer. Maybe they also high, high, have high blood pressure, so at one time we're integrating high blood pressure. Then, of course, this also the integration also so increased access to quality services in an affordable manner. That is the point where we integrated NHIF, and by this, of course, it increased access because of the mama and the NHIF super cover, whereby you need to pay 500 per month and you get free at no, I mean, you don't have to pay at the facility. Then reduce cost on the franchise cost, the operational cost at our, I mean, the operational cost at the organizational level were improved because we had about 22 QAOs and now we we had to do, we currently have about 13 QAOs do the same job and delivering the same. With the support, of course, I've seen some of the providers really growing and improving the way they do business and even in terms of revenues, what they get from the services that they offer. And of course, it is reaching one woman with the same messages using the same amount of money. Great, thanks so much, Sylvia. Um, Angela, let's try going back to you again. We have the same questions that I posed before. Um, compared to Ghana, how is the impetus similar or different for the Philippines to sort out integrating FP into fill health coverage? And who is championing the agenda? Let's try. You're unmuted, Angela. Hmm. Looks like we're still having some problems. All right, I think we will continue to try with Angela, but we'll move back to Jane, if that's okay. Um, Jane, in the past, Ghana's NHIA has confronted gaps between what it wants to purchase and what providers can actually deliver. So a couple of questions for you. For the AMI-supported pilots, how were decisions made on the standard of care to be integrated? So which methods to cover or which to exclude? And were there any components of FP programs thought to be better addressed in an unintegrated fashion? Over to you, thanks. Great, thank you. Uh, next slide, thank you. So, um, having reviewed over uh, health financing approaches in about 20 countries, uh, MSI sort of argues that it's not enough for family planning to be included, but the details matter. These are outlined in our four Ps here. So essentially that the package would include choice of method, that the provider that smaller facilities have to be included and accredited to the scheme, that the package should include case-based payment, so not to uh, provide a bias towards short-term methods, and that the payment um, would, would also mitigate against provider bias. Uh, next slide. Um, so we align the four Ps with the pilot model and a steering committee was formed of different stakeholders, which included the Ministry of Health, NHIS, INGOs. Um, and as you see from, from this uh, slide, this is uh, the activities that were to be implemented. So expanding IPC, um, and it was decided those eligible for free services would hold a, a card, but those without an NHS card should be charged at the agreed tariff rate. Be out of pocket, all clinical methods, 
uh, will be included all accredited facilities, so it's 145 facilities in seven districts, and it will be a case-based tariff with counselling time included. Um, so it was decided a few decisions. It was decided only to offer FP clinical methods um, because some stakeholders felt very strongly that, that condoms and pills shouldn't be integrated because that the providers could gain the insurance system and also because they, those methods don't necessarily guarantee pregnancy prevention and dispensing them means that they might not necessarily be used. Um, and likewise, on the payment side, due to concerns of fraud, it was agreed that counselling time should be built into the service payment tariff. Um, and it was agreed that the amount to be paid to providers would depend on the facility type. So to give an example, an implant insertion in the public chips compound, one of the lowest um, service delivery points, um, is eight Ghana cities, whereas in a private maternity home, sort of an equivalent, it's 11 cities. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Jane. I think Angela has tried her phone. So, Angela, could you just say something just to make sure that audio is working okay? Angela, we can't hear you. It looks like you're unmuted. Could you try again? Okay, Angela, sorry, we'll keep trying, we're doing our best, but we'll move on again with Jane if that's all right. Um, we'll try to get to you by the end of the session. Thanks so much for your persistence. Uh, Jane, so if you don't mind um, talking further about Ame here, uh, let's see. So, um, turning to some emerging lessons that you're seeing through AME, an important theme in the r 4 PSI work is that effective integration requires careful attention across, across many health system functions. So Jane, so far in Ghana, across the main components and functions of the health system, what have been the main enablers of and the obstacles to integration that you've seen? And what comes next in the policy design and implementation process? Thanks, over to you. Great. So the objective of the pilot are twofold. So it's to expand access to quality contraceptive service in the immediate term, while also providing key learning and momentum to the to NHIS for effective inclusion in the service package. So the service delivery arm of this pilot actually commenced in May 18 um, and will continue to April 2020. So we're one year in. So as you can imagine, um, there have been some bumps along the road. Um, I think to start with the very positive, some of the enablers has been a strong commitment from all stakeholders. Um, and people within, within that steering committee have been flexible um, to the design that is adapted to, to all stakeholder needs. Um, it's great that the pilot is being implemented in both the public and private sectors. And added to that, Population Council has also come on board, which is being funded by a, by a separate grant, um, to do qualitative research on the pilot. And of course, you know, we acknowledge that the, the donor support to be able to do this. Um, some of the barriers is that, that due to, to political reasons, some of the NHIA are not issuing new insurance cards because if they're, they're going to have a Ghana Health, a Ghana card with integrated um, information on that one card. So that means that anybody new um, can't get insurance at the moment. Um, the provided capacity to provide LARPs has been very um, mixed in the public sector and Maristad's Ghana are doing some additional training to bring them up to speed. Um, also one of the, the barriers that we found is verifying the, the cards that the public sector requires women to go into the outpatient department and state that they're there for the pilot, the family planning, and that brings privacy and confidentiality issues. And then uh, lastly, there's been limited demand creation to let people know that family planning is now available for free in these pilot districts. Uh, next slide, please. So um, today we've had um, just over 5,500 women who have received um, family planning services within these pilot districts, of which just over 2,000 have been insured. And the rest, over about 3,500, have been paid out of pocket. So our initial results have shown that more insured women are actually opting for long-term methods over injectables than the uninsured. 
So um, the next steps for implementation is to, is to keep the pilot until April 2020. Um, we're introducing a provider MIS system to give more uh, real-time data. Uh, as I said, we're doing more awareness raising and demand creation. Um, and also strengthening the commodity distribution availability to make sure there's no stock outs. There's the monitoring of the data. Um, and then moving forward, the, we're going to be evaluating uh, the four P's on effects, choice, uptake, quality, and also equity. Um, and then most importantly, the uh, modeling of cost and cost averted are being fed into an actuarial model study, which is ongoing at the moment. And then the qualitative assessment um, by Population Council, those results will be used to help other countries design um, yeah, in future. Great, thanks so much, Jane. We really appreciate that, and it's really interesting to hear all these details um, about what the next steps are going forward. So, audience, we're gonna try one more time with Angela, because I promise she has really interesting stuff to talk about, so we don't want to leave her out. Angela, could you try one more time? Angela, we're not hearing you. All right, well, I think we'll move to Sylvia, if that's okay, and Angela, maybe we can, um, we can finally get things working in the audience Q&A uh, so that we can talk about ThinkWell's really interesting work as well. So Sylvia, if I can move to um, you one more time. Um, another major theme of the work that R4D and PSI did is that um, integration isn't all or nothing, and it's not all at once either. So a couple of questions for you as well. Uh, what are some challenges that PS Kenya did not anticipate when you started with this new model? And how are you pivoting from those challenges? And how can service delivery organizations help make sure that family planning doesn't get lost as countries move towards more integrated service packages? Thanks, Sylvia, over to you. Thanks, Rebecca. So some of the challenges we faced was that integration takes time because as I mentioned earlier, we were integrating the quality assurance officer's work and also the demand creation work at the community level. So the teams had been used to just carrying out one, for example, if it's for demand creation, just talking about one health area. I know you were there telling them to talk about about three related health areas. So that was really time consuming. And what we did about that was to really try and be, you know, to come up with a prioritization matrix to be very good in planning and also to look at a month in the life of, for example, a quality assurance officer. So we became better in planning and also prioritizing. We also, we also benefited from our quality assurance tools like the HNQIS, which also aims to create efficiencies. And the QAOs, of course, had to target the facilities that needed more, you know, more, I mean, were really lagging behind as far as quality assurance was concerned. The other challenge that we faced was that we realized that the the, the programs that were riding on the main projects, for example, sometimes were not adequately covered, and especially when it came to demand creation, because you can only hold people for a certain number of hours, maybe like for one hour, if you really want them to retain the messages. So time was a, a factor, even on the part of the consumer, and it also affected the, the quality of work that you were doing. And then on the other hand is that we realized that different health areas do not always suit the targeted population, for example, if you're targeting NHIF, you, you, you want to target people for NHIF, the main target population is men because they're the decision makers and they'll not want to attend an FP session. The other challenge was that message uptake by, by the consumers at community level was also compromised. The retention was either for the last thing that they had or the thing that were most interested in. So for the NMO, for the NMO model, the main challenge we had was that it was not so easy to just come and integrate it in the, I mean, in the discussions on UHC. For example, NHF right now only accredits individual facilities, and they are not ready to accredit facilities as a as a unit. So we are still in discussions with them. The other solution, because I know the one, was that we tried to bundle the health areas that are related. That worked very well for us, especially for demand creation. At, at the facility level, we started co-selling services, whereby if mothers have come for, for PNC or they have come on immunization, immunization days, as they are waiting, we start talking to them about family planning. And on the other hand, of course, the provider is very key, such that we want to use him 
to co-sell the services and at the same time if a woman has given birth to talk about him her taking that method immediately after birth so behavior change also of course was a key component of course it's a challenge because you have to walk you know along with the provider so that they see the need going to the next slide whereby i need to talk about what countries are doing or need to do so that fb doesn't get lost the fp policies need to be an integral piece both at national level and county level and it is very important to leverage on fp as a priority for national and county government this can be done by strengthening health systems whether it is service delivery whether it is human resource we need to think about community security we need to think about what is very important to move this agenda forward whether it's having very strong fp champions in kenya we have seen some of the counties have taken the first ladies for the counties as fp champions and that has really helped them allocation of resources to fp is very important otherwise it can be in the plan it can be in the policy but if you don't have resources that can never be moved forward and of course most important as you're talking about universal health coverage then it needs to be part of the nhif package or universal health coverage as we do the pilot this of course has been a, a, a challenge in kenya because i think as jean explained in her presentation nhf is it as very expensive it is in the nhf package but it is not exactly you know it isn't it is it is not being implemented because it's expensive for the private providers yeah great thank you sylvia that's really that's really interesting and thanks for all of your thoughts um that I'm sure would be uh, good learning for the rest of us uh, working in family planning. So unfortunately, I think we're not going to continue with Angela, although Angela is fantastic and we would have loved for her to participate, but her colleague Matt, uh, Matt Boxall is on the phone and will be able to um, respond to the questions that Angela had prepared. Um, so Matt, would you mind just introducing yourself very quickly and then we can talk about the, uh, the work that you've done in the Philippines. I can try. I'm hoping the technology will work for me. Can you hear me, folks? We definitely can. Loud and clear. Thanks. Okay. That's great. So I'm Matt Bokshul. I'm Deputy Director for Thinkwell on the Strategic Purchasing for Primary Health Care project. Uh, Philippines is one of our key countries and Andrew is one of our, our leading thinkers there um, doing amazing work. And I'm so sorry, Angela, that you couldn't get the technology to work for you today. Um, I will try to do some, some justice. Um, you really are much better, everybody hearing from Angela and the team in the Philippines, but uh, I'll, I'll give it a go. Thanks, Matt. And just just to let you know, we only have about five minutes, so I'm I'm really throwing down the gauntlet for you here. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Okay. Um, do you want to shoot the questions, or do you want me to just uh, to just go? Maybe you can just go. Just talk through. Okay. So sure. um, a, a little bit of context in the in the Philippines. It's a relatively low uh, MCPR country. Uh, PhilHealth, the national insurer, is, uh, has high coverage compared with a lot of the, the countries uh, we're discussing, Kenya and Ghana. Um, and, and PhilHealth has made progressive efforts over the last 10 years or so to incorporate family planning um, methods into its package of, of coverage. Uh, it, up until 2015, when uh, when implants, contraceptive implants, were added. Um, implants and IUDs, long-acting reversibles, both get very high, generous reimbursement rates uh, at around the $50 a unit level from PhilHealth. But there have been a number of challenges in um, the effectiveness of that. There was a temporary restraining order um, issued against the government um, through till the end of 2017, which, which not only prevented hormonal contraceptives being delivered through the program and reimbursed by, by PhilHealth, but also sent very mixed messages to providers. There are also um, quite high barriers to entry for a lot of um, Philippine private midwives to, to joining PhilHealth. There has been a constraint. Um, and these factors along perhaps with um, some conservatism 
um, some social conservatism around family pl family planning issues has led to really a very low, disappointing uptake of family planning under Phil under Phil Health. The total claims for family planning is around 10,000 claims per year at the moment. Um, with a very large population and a very large unmet need for family planning. So PhilHealth has not yet been as successful in um, uh, making that family planning offer a reality for many Filipino women. Um, moving on to the, the private sector questions, um, there, is a, there is a history in the Philippines, I, I believe, of um, a sort of changing demand for family planning. I think certainly some of the work that WHO has been doing over the last few years has suggested that um, the barriers to increasing MCPR in the Philippines are largely now on the on the supply side. So a, a relatively conservative, religiously conservative society 20, 30 years ago where many people did not desire to use modern contraception has now largely changed. Actually, rates of acceptance of contraception in the population are relatively high, but accessing those services seem to be remain a challenge. Private providers are, as you can see, a, a large um, play an important role in the Philippine health sector, and actually, in terms of pure numbers, uh, PhilHealth accredits more private providers than government providers um, in terms of facilities. But the opportunity, perhaps, that we're talking about in terms of um, uh, in terms of improving access is perhaps concentrated in those private providers because of this issue of missed opportunities. The, the work that WHO, this is a slide from Howard Sobel at WHO presented last year, he looked at when clients visit facilities for reproductive health needs, whether they are offered family planning counseling. And you can see that in the vast majority of cases, even at reproductive health clinics, um, there is no FP counseling offered. So. The perspective that we have taken in the Philippines is that provider behavior, and specifically that behavior of offering counseling to women who are, who are um, going to a clinic, going to a facility with reproductive health questions, um, is a critical factor. And that PhilHealth, which accredits many providers, can play a key role in influencing that behavior. We feel that that influence, that signaling from PhilHealth could be more effective in the private sector where there's a direct correlation between uh, the PhilHealth payment or the PhilHealth payment would flow directly to that provider. Um, so that leverage may be stronger in the private sector and that combined with the uh, the good geographical coverage of private providers presents an opportunity. So let's move on from the private sector and just touch on the current context for PhilHealth, which is that at the uh, beginning of this year, a bill was passed uh, called the UHC Law, um, which sets out a fundamental restructuring of the health sector in in the Philippines with PhilHealth taking a very significant role of purchasing services that are targeted to individuals, um, whilst DOH, the Department of Health, maintains responsibility for broader public health services. There is some discussion about uh, where services like family planning might fit in that division, but our expectation is that family planning will be funded principally by PhilHealth. The work that Angela and her colleagues, Mary Fair and Jello, are doing at the moment is to support the Philippine government as it works out the implementing rules and regulations of that law. And over the next six months, there's a huge 
pressure to uh, to come up with the way that the law will be implemented. Within that, the primary care benefits package is an area that Angela is particularly focusing on, and the question of where family planning and maternal health services, uh, in addition, will fit within that primary care benefit package, how they will be reimbursed. And we're trying to inform that with an understanding of what are the current barriers to behavior change for private primary care providers. So how do we contract those providers into service delivery networks, which will be the, the prime focus of contracting for PhilHealth? And how do we ensure that within those networks, the signals, the behavioral signals that PhilHealth is trying to send to providers are effectively received to encourage those providers to offer high quality family planning services? And let me pause there. I hope I'm I, yeah. with great apologies to Angela. I'm sorry. Well, Matt, you are a true professional to be able to pick up, um, and that's uh, credit to you and Angela that you're able to work so seamlessly together. So thank you for that overview of your work in the Philippines. Um, we're going to go ahead and transition to the audience Q&A part of this discussion, and we look forward to questions. We've received a few, but if um, you have any burning questions in the last few minutes of our webinar, please do submit those through the WebEx chat function, and we will try to um, look at them within the time that we have left. So we do have one that was sent in earlier, and it's specifically for Michael, so I'll ask him to respond to that fairly quickly so that we can get to the other ones. Um, you talked about the importance of understanding the status quo before making integration decisions. So besides the current extent of integration, what other features of the context matter? Thanks, Rebecca. Um, of course, every context is different, and every country health system and, and individual health program change over time, so the, the context is ever evolving. I said earlier that the current relationship between the vertical program and the broader system will, to a large extent, shape what's desirable and feasible at any point in time. I mean, this includes parts of the program that may be outperforming the rest of the system, um, which is often true in functions like planning, monitoring, data systems, oversight. Um, lots of other contextual factors matter to any health reform, and there are a few things we think matter specifically to the integration discussion. Um, one of them is the trajectory of the health needs. So family planning and a, and a few other health needs are things that don't really ever go away. You could think, you know, every birth cohort needs vaccinations, too. That's not really a health need that, that goes away over time. Um, but others, like HIV, which has a very sort of long-term global elimination agenda, um, you know, require lifetime treatment, so the, the need for services um, also doesn't go away there. But some infectious diseases may be slated for elimination, and, and they may disappear over time. Um, so these trajectories really will affect what facets of vertical programs need to be sustained and integrated or somehow morphed as, as they become more a part of the, the mainstream health system. Um, lastly, it's impossible to ignore the links between integration and donor graduation policies. Countries that are on the verge of losing external support, whether it's for a specific health need like family planning or for the health sector overall, are probably going to feel greater urgency and face sort of additional challenges of timing um, than, than countries that maybe have a longer time horizon for, for graduating out of the donor support. So those are just a couple of the contextual factors that we think are, are really salient to an integration discussion specifically. Great, thank you. Um, we have one other question that Matt actually spoke to in his remarks, but maybe Jane could respond as well. Um, Jane, could you speak about whether there are any unique considerations emerging from the potential effects of integration on key measures of FP quality, like informed choice, um, rights-based approaches, et cetera, as well as on sustainable supply of FP commodities? Sure. So thanks for that question. I mean, quality is, is very, very important. Um, yeah, so within... From a provider perspective and a payment perspective, the, the tariffs that have been set have included a cancelling time. 
And as part of this pilot, um, quality assurance is being conducted by MSI Ghana to, to ensure that the providers are adhering to quality standards. Um, so in the informed choice, I mean, that again really comes down to um, ensuring that the, the clients are aware of what um, choices there are. And also, um, again, through the, through the tariffs, and, and this is where I think Silva alluded to it, with capitation, um, FP is included in Kenya, for example, but providers tend to have the bias towards the short-term methods because it's cheaper to provide. So it's also about empowering the client to, to demand what is there, and that's by knowing what is in the service package. Great, thank you so much, Jane. And we have time for one more question, and Sylvia, this one is for you. Um, how was PS Kenya able to build the capacity of just one individual or, or one or two individuals to ensure quality assurance across all the them thematic areas of health at these health facilities? Thanks. Okay. So uh, when we started to integrate the programs, of course, one of the key things we did was to train them. The good thing is that this, the, for example, the quality assurance officers, all of them are clinical people, and it was very easy for them to just understand all the components. And for the demand creation team, of course, we had to take them through the training. So as I said earlier, what was actually a challenge was not so much about the capacity of the quality assurance officers to carry out all the tasks or the demand creation team to do that, because that was within our control and to ensure that we build their capacity, the major challenge was in the operationalization of the integration, whereby they really, we really need to plan better, to actually look, for example, at the, the quality component. What does it take for us to build the, the capacity of the provider in a certain health area? How much time do we take? And what can the quality assurance officer do in one day? What components can be integrated? And the integration was actually mainly in the supportive supervision. That one day, one person, the person will go and just take, check the, do the monitoring. In the, I mean, the monitoring bit. Check where the provider was with safe care. Check where they were with HMQIS, and at the same time, address the other, you know, the other key areas that they had discussed with the provider in terms of action points. So for us, it was mainly training and ensuring that we are building their capacity whenever they an opportunity like during the quality meetings and doing the, I mean, the, the ensuring that even the providers are understanding the process. Of course, we also have to train the providers because they are the key component in the, I mean, they are, they are key in the integration. Great. Thank you, Sylvia. That's fantastic. Thanks so much. Um, so that's all the time we have for Thanks for your excellent questions. And I think, you know, the work that r d and PSI carried out at the more kind of analytical, conceptual level showed that this is a very complex process and there's much to be discovered. And thank you to the panelists for providing the examples of your excellent work um, in these three countries, really showing how complex it can be, but that progress really can be made. So we invite you to visit that blog, um, look at our report and case studies, in case you're interested for more. And we'd love to see your uh, comments online if you have any after reading those pieces. And finally, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And a huge thank you to our panelists, um, to Michael, to Jane, to Sylvia, and especially to Angela and Matt for being able to pick up and, and give us insight on your work. Um, we wish everybody has a great rest of the day, and thanks again. Bye.